Hello, and welcome to Not Very Scary Stories. First of all, this will be our first Stories from Around the Internet episode. Our first two stories are brought here from the r slash no sleep subreddit on Reddit. No sleep allows stories of fiction and nonfiction on this subreddit. So whether these stories are real or not, it doesn't make them any less terrifying. But take them with a grain of salt. I'd like to leave this up to you whether you'd like to believe it or not. And I'd also like to thank you guys for the support thus far on all platforms that you can find us on, including YouTube. I'm Zenith Dark Sky, and I'll be your host tonight. Enjoy. Our first story comes from r slash no sleep. The title is, I was in prison for 15 years. There was a skinwalker in there with us. Hosted by user Enuk Shaken. A little background first. I was serving a 15 year sentence in a penitentiary in Southern Arizona. What I was in there for isn't important, During my stay there, there were countless things that happened that no one could explain and even more that no one wanted to know more about. It all started with a prison legend. Supposedly, years ago, something awful and unexplainable happened in the prison. Every morning, we'd be woken up and expected to stand near the front of our cells while guards visually confirmed we were present and accounted for. Apparently, about a year before I got sent there, The most brutal and unexplainable thing happened during one of these routines. A man who had a cell to himself looked very off during his check. When a guard pulled over another guard to help him check it out, they found it wasn't actually the prisoner they were expecting at all. It was a totally different man. This man was wearing the skin of the other man over him. Loosely fitting, draped over him, apparently looked like a real monster. The scariest things were though, was the guy wearing the skin was not an inmate. They had no idea how he even got into prison, let alone a cell. What's worse is that they couldn't even figure out who the hell he was. He wasn't documented anywhere, and what's worse than that, they never found the body of the man of the skin he was wearing. Pretty grisly stuff, I know. And I realize that's not the go-to definition of a skinwalker, but that's what the prison called him. The skinwalker. Didn't help that the guy never talked, apparently. Anyways, that's what started the whole skinwalker superstition around the yard. Apparently the guy got shipped to a different spot about a month after it happened, and just about everyone in Gen Pop felt all the better for it. I heard about the story on the second day of my stay, I love a story to hear to place in your home for the foreseeable future. Now, until the real shit though. Sure, the guy was the skinwalker, but all he did in the long run was get an old lifer Navajo inmate to tell everyone about actual skinwalkers. It seemed like a lot of the prison culture actually revolved around them. Now apparently, skinwalkers are tricky to point out in the spot, but if you manage to survive around one for more than a minute, almost everyone can tell the mannerisms are all off. They can mimic human speech but not replicate it. They twitch maniacally. They have an unnatural gait while walking, but apparently they got better with experience. The old Navajo guy, his name was Carl, said that he was sure there was an actual one among the prisoners. Slowly picking us off over the years, he called it the Grandmaster Skinwalker at one point. Apparently, He thought it had human mannerisms down so well you might not even be able to tell if it was your cellmate for a day or two. It had to be good, he posited one night. He would expect a skinwalker to jump at any opportunity for a kill. But this one realized it had a revolving door of people to kill coming to it, and masterfully bided its time, as Carl thought, for years. A lot of guys found humor in it. A lot more were really on edge about it. Every once in a while in prison, people snap. Sometimes you'll find your cellmate swinging in front of your bunk, strung up around the neck by his pant leg. Sometimes you just can't take it anymore. But in our yard, people tended to snap in a very special way. It wouldn't be an outburst at dinner or a silent suicide in the night. Guys would just stop talking. 
hunch over and shuffle around. Any friendships they had would be mostly out the window. They would turn into a loner during rec time. They would let their hair hang in front of their face. No one liked to talk about it. Like if they did, it would happen to them next. I felt the same way. I didn't know if it was a skinwalker or just people going crazy, but I didn't want to find out. It wasn't clockwork or anything, but every time someone snapped in this way, it wasn't more than a couple weeks before they were shipped off or transferred to God knows where without anyone else knowing beforehand. Then there was the nighttime occurrences. Short, loud bursts of sound echoed through my cell block during all hours of the night on a regular basis. It sounded like a mix between a pig's dying squeals and nails on a chalkboard. Just another thing no one liked to talk about. Even scarier were the shadows and footsteps. The block was dimly illuminated in the night by a few lights hanging from the ceiling outside the cells. I myself saw shadows flit across my walls on a regular occasion when there were definitely no guards near my cell. One time near the end of my sentence I woke up, looked at my back wall and found a perfect silhouette of a person standing there but when I looked my bunkmate was asleep and no one was outside my cell and the footsteps. Everyone hated the fucking footsteps. They were the scariest part. In the night, sometimes more rarely than the shadows, you would hear ungodly fast footsteps. They sounded like wet feet slapping on tile floor. Whatever caused them would fly from one end of the block to the other in a dead sprint. Whatever it was, it was inhumanely fast. If you happened to be awake before it started, by the time you heard the footsteps on one side of your cell and whipped your head around to see the thing run by, it sounded like it was three cells past you. Everyone hated the footsteps. I agreed. I thought they were the worst. I was released from that place about a month ago, and I have more stories than I can count. I swear it was nearly my turn. About a week before I was discharged, my cellmate and a good friend of mine snapped in the same kind of way. I didn't sleep for an entire week. Well, I did sleep, of course, but never for more than a few minutes at a time. Never turned my back on the guy. Scariest thing? I woke up one night to him, somehow snaking his body through the bars of our cell. For reference, I couldn't get anything past my shoulder through them. The worst part, though, he was coming back into our cell. On the day of my release, I didn't say a word to him just left. He seemed fine with it, so so was I. I had made it through 15 years of prison fights, gang disputes, and for all I know, skinwalker abductions. I left through the front gates a free man. As I walked through the fence for the rec yard, I spotted my cellmate, standing off on his own like he had for the last week or so. I shook my head, not even really sure if it was him anymore. I took one last look over the yard, this time from the other side of the fence. I wish I hadn't. There, standing off on his own, on the other side of the yard, was Carl, slouched over, eyeing the other inmates and twitching maniacally. This next story is titled, I Think Something Is Seriously Wrong With One Of My Campers, from r slash no sleep, posted by the user, Casa. Dorada. I've been going to this camp since I was six. Once I'd aged out, I returned as a junior counselor. Now I'm finally a senior counselor, and I've been one for about five years already. In all my years at camp, I've had my fair share of laughs and screams and got myself in and out of more trouble than I can even recall. Now, it was my turn to tell the legends and lore of the camp and terrify new generations of campers. The only downer though is that with the technological boom of late, Gen Z, these kids don't scare as easily as we used to. They've seen much worse on the internet and tales of headless axe murderers and tomato farmer serial killers barely even merit a sweaty brow. In my years as a counselor and as a camper, I've seen a lot. I don't tend to scare easily though. Being responsible for a bunch of little kids, not to mention your rowdy trouble magnet friends at times, will give you that false sense of bravado in times of uncertainty and fear. Except, 
What do you do when the thing you're supposed to be watching over and protecting turns out to be your biggest threat? This is where I have to bring up Molly. I'll call her Molly for privacy's sake. She seemed like a normal kid, outwardly with unruly golden ringlet curls, a button nose, and pale gray eyes. But there was something about her, whether it be the dark glint in her eye or the stiff way she carried herself. Can't be entirely sure. All I know is that I've never seen a child command her parents on where to set up her bunk and how to set it up. Between her haggard mother and father's faces and her cool, composed expression, it was evident who was in control here. I watched him unload their car quickly as she stood on the porch, clutching a book to her chest, expressionless. I went over to her and squatted beside her, smiling. I regarded my clipboard with the names of the girls in my cabin. You must meet Molly, I exclaimed. It's so nice to meet you. Is this your first year of camp? Silence. Her lack of response took me aback. Just as I was about to open my mouth to speak again, her father stomped up the stairs with the last of her luggage. He shot her a look I couldn't quite decipher, and they slunk inside. As the rest of the parents unloaded their cars, my eyes fell upon Molly's mother, standing pin straight in front of the passenger door of their beaten Volkswagen. I waved at her as enthusiastically as I could, trying to shut the rejection I'd just faced out of my mind. She slowly raised her limp hand in a half wave, her blank expression ever the same. She also seemed a bit slack jawed. I let my hand fall loosely at my side as she slowly let hers fall back down to hers. Her movements were jerky and unnatural. It was unsettling. Never breaking eye contact, I made my way back inside to help the rest of my kids unpack. Admittedly, the first few days were fairly normal. First couple of nights, I had to sleep on a mattress on the floor of the kids' bunk room because they were either scared or they missed their moms and begged me to stay with them. I was well acquainted with the floor at this point because this typically happened every year with the newest campers. By night three, I was ready to bring up my returning to the counselor's room. They were big girls now going away to camp and they needed to be brave. And of course, they could find me in the next room over if they needed me. A few girls were wary, but most had gotten used to cabin life and were okay with finally toughing it out. By that night, I was back in my normal room with my junior counselor. Leaving the girls unattended was my first major mistake. It was the Thursday of the first week of camp when things began to happen. I was jolted from the sleep by ear-splitting shrieks from the room next door. I practically flew from my top bunk with my junior counselor in tow as we beelined it for the girls' room. I burst through the door and found them cowering all together in a circle on the floor, holding each other and crying. Some were too scared to even move or breathe. What is going on here, girls? I demanded. Why were you screaming? What happened? Between blubbering sobs, one of the girls pointed at the back window where Molly was standing. Molly scared us. She was scratching at the window from outside. I cocked my eyebrow at the dark, unmoving little figure at the back of the room. The red glow of the exit sign seemed to illuminate her eyes. I squinted at her frail silhouette. She was definitely still inside. There was no back door, no porch, and the cabin was held up by cement blocks. It would have been impossible for her to be peering in from the back window. I only told them a little story, came a meek voice from the shadowy mass. What story? I demanded. The story of the three headless nuns. I froze. No way. No fucking way. That was the scariest camp story we had. We didn't tell the story to campers until there were at least ten. And who the hell had told her? I pushed a wave of questions out of my mind. I spent the next few hours telling the girls the story wasn't real. Molly sat quietly in her bunk, watching soberly as the other traumatized six-year-olds sobbed in their beds. I desperately tried to comfort them, but in the end, I dragged my mattress and sleeping bag back to my original spot on the floor. From then on, the girls couldn't sleep unless the windows were all securely covered, and they absolutely despised Molly. I'm talking full-on shunning and exclusion. I used every counselor trick I had up my sleeve to try and make things better and to reconcile the girls, but none of them were having any of it. Molly was especially disinterested in the others, choosing instead to read her copies of scary stories to tell in the dark over and over again. 
Over the course of the following weeks, Molly's behavior became increasingly sinister. She hid crickets and spiders in the girls' beds. She threw their toothbrushes in the unflushed toilets. She threw their clothes in the bushes and trees as it rained. She would hide under their bunks and make ungodly noises to scare them at night. She'd jump on top of them in the lake and pin them down until I sprinted over and pulled her off. She even slipped peanuts into one of the girls' bags of trail mix. The same girl who was deathly allergic to peanuts. After the peanut incident, the camp administrators and I decided that Enough was enough. She was going to kill someone at this rate. I got into the phone myself and let her parents have it. I recite the ever-growing list of offenses Molly had committed against my other campers and ultimately delivered the news that she was no longer welcome at camp. There was a long pause on the other end before Molly's mother monotonously agreed to come pick her up in the morning. I sighed and looked to the head counselor who sat beside me. He groaned and nodded. One more night and then she'd be out of my hair. I wasn't fully confident that my girls would make it through the night alive if I left them alone with Molly, so I again slept on the floor. Spent more nights on that floor than in the counselor's room, but what choice did I have? I was awoken by a soft skittering noise. My eyes burst open and I stared at the ceiling, unmoving. A raccoon? No, bigger. It sounded far away enough to be on the porch. My stomach lurched at the realization that whatever was making the skittery noise was inside the room with us. I sat up and took a long look around. The girls were all in their beds, at least the girls in the bottom bunks who I could see were. From the ground, I obviously couldn't tell about the top bunks, but these bunk beds were obnoxiously creaky, and I would have noticed if one of them had even moved. I propped myself up on my elbow and listened some more. Silence. Sighing deeply, I lay back down on my stomach and flopped into my pillow. I breathed deeply, watching the back windows nervously. I still can't fully come to terms with the events which occurred next. All I can remember is an air of unbelievable dread settling down over me like a weighted blanket suffocating me. I tried to move my limbs, but found I couldn't. The skittering noise came again. Over and over again in my brain, a voice kept shrinking, do not move. My eyes started around the room, desperately searching for some sort of logic to this madness. There's no way this is sleep paralysis. It had settled in way too fast. That's when I realized it wasn't sleep paralysis. This was what they meant when people say paralyzed in terror. More skittering and then a small, dark figure crept out of a shadow in the top corner of the room. It was small, but its limbs were gangly, its hair was unkempt and unruly. The only feature I could clearly make of it was the reflection of the red exit light in its eyes as they locked on the mine. Slowly, creakily, it crawled down the wall like a spider towards the ground. My lungs refused to take in oxygen as its twiggy limbs jerked and cracked as it crawled towards me. Tears welled up in my eyes as I realized it was crawling towards me, upside down. It crumpled in on itself as it came closer, the skittering noises coming from its now visibly gaping mouth. I wanted to scream, run, anything, but I couldn't. I was frozen in place, shivering and sobbing silently as it came to hover over me. Its forehead grazed my own as its white pupilless eyes bore into mine. Creaking and popping, it began to stand, contorting around itself as it stood up to glower down at me. Looking up at it, it looked like a normal six-year-old girl. The thing suddenly began to heave, as though it were laughing hysterically, although no sound came from the gaping hole in its face. Every so often, its neck would crack as it craned from side to side. It wriggled its gangly fingers, snapping with each jerky movement, then took in a long, deep creaky breath. It was a sound I had never heard and would never hear again. I'm not sure when I blacked out. I woke surrounded by paramedics and panicked camp administrators. My junior counselor recounted to me later that I was lying on my back on the floor, my mouth agape in a soundless shriek, and my eyes rolled back so far that they appeared glassy and white. Upon her trying to shake me awake, I fell into a violent seizure. 
seeing as it was my first ever seizure, I was to be taken to the hospital despite my protests. The administrators assured me that my kids were fine and that I could come back once I was given the all clear by the doctors. I was carted past a group of concerned and curious campers as they were all waiting outside to catch a peek of the action. I glanced over at them and gave them all an enthusiastic thumbs up promising I was fine and would be back soon. One wild haired child caught my eye. Molly. She watched me silent with a slack jaw, her mouth gaping too wide for her small face. Her eyes were pupilless and white. The girl's tiny shoulders slowly began to heave in pure silence as I was loaded into the ambulance. For a moment, it looked as though she were laughing. This next story is actually a comment on a post on r slash ask reddit. Um, the post was nurses and doctors of reddit what's your weirdest slash scariest paranormal stories that took place during work the comment post was user jowcott i'm a psychiatric nurse early in my career i worked at a residential mental health facility there was a resident i'll call marion duquin he was an elective mute which simply means that he didn't, wouldn't, couldn't talk, but there were no pathological findings as to why. He had spoken earlier in his life and in fact seemed quite normal back then, with the notable exception of being close to seven feet tall. He'd been raised in the deep south and joined the military when he was 19. After boot camp, he was stationed somewhere in the south. One night, he just vanished. He was declared an AWOL for years, and finally, he was declared missing and dead. Ten years later, a seven-foot-tall man walked into a VA hospital emergency room in my part of the Midwest and said to the receptionist, My name is Marion Duquesne, and I've been dead for ten years. Those were the last words he ever spoke. He was covered with dust, and he was wearing the same clothes he'd been reported to be wearing the night he vanished. His social security number had not been used and he had no identification on his person. However, they were able to identify him, I guess via fingerprints. He was well fed and in good health, except for his refusal to speak. The family was notified, but they said they had already grieved their lost man and that whomever was claiming to be him simply could not be. They said he was a haint and a stand-in for their dead relative and demanded not to be contacted again. Marion paced all day every day, not in a frantic way, but just lumbering up and down the halls and outside. He smiled all the time and we'd be moving his mouth in a way that indicated talking or muttering, but he was dead silent. He had an unnerving habit of throwing his head back with his mouth wide open as if he were laughing heartily, but not even a breath could be heard. If told to go to the dining room for a meal, he'd go and eat, but if nobody told him, he just kept pacing, never indicating hunger. If offered a cigarette, he'd smoke it in an oddly formal way, almost delicately, if that makes sense, but he never seemed to crave smoking. The man wanted nothing. If I talked to him, he appeared to listen, periodically throwing his head back in that laughter mimicking way of his. There was nothing to do for this man. Various medications were tried, but they did not affect him, either positively or negatively. Occupational therapy did nothing because Miriam would just grin unless told to stay put. He'd get up and start pacing again. On my last day of the job, on my way to something better, the last thing I saw was Marion pacing in the parking lot, throwing his head back to laugh. Later, I wondered if all along I'd been dealing with a ghost. All these years later, I still don't know.